welcome back, Junior Archaeologist. This is the second part of a walking tour I took of Midtown Reno, Nevada that I went on when COVID restrictions first hit in 2020. And now that lockdowns are returning to certain parts of the country this winter season of 2020 slash 2021, although who knows when this is coming out, <laughs> it almost feels like deja vu all over again. To quote a famous sports personality, and it continues to be a nice surprise to learn so much more about the places that I've been walking by for years. If you live anywhere near Peerless Cleaners, then you practically live in the center of non-gambling, mostly locals part of Reno. But a hundred years ago, this would have been the edge of town. Not just the edge of town, but the sort of place where a factory, a machine shop, and whatever other industrial concern you might have been wanting to build would have fit right in. The kind that would have taken up entire blocks. There are now two streets here that didn't even exist when the building was originally the commercial soap factory. The first building was built in 1906 when they first moved from their longtime home near Virginia City, Nevada. I just felt like throwing that in. That first building operated right into the 30s when the business and machinery was sold because, well, it was the Great Depression and that sort of thing was happening all over the place. Unfortunately, the now empty building burned down in 1935. But the good thing is that St. Lawrence Street could now go all the way from Plumas to Virginia right after the Great Depression and the Second World War, which meant that this was a vacant lot right up until 1946, by which point this part of Midtown was finished transforming into a residential neighborhood. This building has always operated as a dry cleaning business, although a hat shop did share the storefront for a while. The next surprising thing is that Peerless Cleaners has only had two owners from when it first opened. And, in case you're interested, it was originally opened by Bob Cantrell, who was seriously injured in a car accident in 1949, which is when it was bought by the Bonifant family who continue to run it to this day. stop on our tour is the Martha Wingfield House, which is less interesting for the number of businesses that have operated out of it, and more for the fact that this was a wealthy person's house in 1912, which just struck me as unusual, and for being the smallest piece of property named after a Wingfield in Nevada, or at least I think it is. A brief rundown is that this whole neighborhood was on its way to being all craftsman-style bungalows when Mrs. Wingfield first moved in. Mrs. Wingfield was a recent widow who had been living in the Bay Area when she moved to Reno to be closer to her son, who had just had his first child. Her son George Wingfield is very well remembered in Reno, even if a lot of people hanging out in Wingfield Park or living in Wingfield Springs don't realize that these places are named for an actual person who went a long way to making Reno a respectable city. Well, as respectable as it's going to get. <laughs> George moved to Reno after making a mining fortune in Goldfield, Nevada, which was not too hard to do during the first years of the 20th century. Goldfield was one of, if not the, biggest gold strike Nevada ever had. At its height, Goldfield had a bar that took 80 bartenders to properly staff, and all the usual stuff it took to keep hordes and hordes of newly wealthy miners happy. I can't even comment on how big that bar must have been. Once he settled down in Reno, George started buying banks and earned himself the nickname the Emperor of Nevada. It goes without saying that he could have built his mother the sort of home that had golden bathroom fixtures and all the other things that we associate with the wealthy and influencers of today. But instead, she chose to live in this modest home. I'm not going to comment too much on that other than to congratulate Mrs. Wingfield on her good taste. This popular building, today known as St. Lawrence Commons, is officially named the Froelich Building. Froelich? Froelich? Well, whatever. And was once a western outpost of the once nationwide and powerful Piggly Wiggly grocery store chain, which might be a surprise today because there are plenty of places where no one will ever have heard of Piggly Wiggly, and others where it's just a small regional thing, like Sheets or in and out Piggly Wiggly's claim to fame was that it was one of the first self-service grocery stores ever. It's difficult to picture today, but back in the olden days, going to a grocery store was more like shopping on Amazon or curbside pickup, except you had to go to the store with your list instead of like hopping on the PC or your phone, and someone would walk the aisles for you and assemble your orders, which actually is kind of like today, which is really amazing. It's like we've come full circle. 
I personally hate going to the grocery store and found that the one silver lining about 2020 is that it's the year I discovered online grocery shopping. Thank God. Although on a quick note, it definitely works a lot better in Reno than in other cities I've tried it in because I do a lot of traveling and have occasion to order online in various other cities, just so FYI. But back to Piggly Wiggly, it was founded in Memphis, Tennessee in 1916, and its founder, Clarence Saunders, worked out and patented the self-serve grocery store model the following year. Piggly Wiggly's actually would have been the first place where you would have had to deal with checkout stands, could see the prices for things that you were buying, which meant that everything was the same price for everyone, which was definitely not the case before Piggly Wiggly's, and where you had to fill up a grocery cart. Piggly Wiggly's are actually the reason why branding, product design, and product advertising even came into existence. Before then, you just took what the grocery store gave you. Afterwards, products had to catch the attention of the people who might not even know anything about the products they were buying other than what was on the box or the label. All things which are really weird to think that there was a time before those things even existed. By 1932, its annual sales were 180 million, which I assume is in 1932 dollars. So that's a lot. I think. Which brings up the obvious question of why most people have never heard of it. The short version is that Clarence Saunders got caught trying to artificially inflate company stock prices, was forced out, and the company was broken up. But it was broken up in a regional fashion. The store and every Piggly Wiggly in the area was bought out by Sewell's. At least I think that's how you pronounce it. And that's a local Nevada chain. The same thing happened to pretty much all the other stores. It's tough to imagine today, but this neighborhood had a whole lot of grocery stores, including a competitor right next door and one right across the street. And none of them had parking or would have taken up much more room than a modern 7-Eleven. Eventually this building took its current form by the late 50s when people found that they preferred supermarkets and buildings like this that had tiny little grocery stores became, well, passe. The Gerardo Apartment Gerardo? I just said that the same way twice. Anyway, the Gerardo Apartments is probably the best known building in Midtown, although everyone just knows it better as the building that houses the Bar Shays, which I'm definitely willing to bet is the best known bar in all of Reno. Originally constructed in 1928, there was a grocery store on the right side of the building, and that was run by Louis Gunter. The left side housed a whole bunch of businesses, including Penguin Ice Cream, which supposedly served 4,500 people during its opening week in 1935, which I assume was a lot. Like so many buildings in Midtown, it was designed by Nevada's most famous architect, Frederick de Longchamps. Hey, got that right in the first try, who I have definitely mentioned many times in previous episodes of this series. And like so many buildings that had any sort of apartments in those days, it was a popular address in the days when Nevada was one of the few places where it was easy to get a divorce. The most distinctive architectural aspect of the building is the decorative brickwork, which doesn't mean sculptures or anything like that, because obviously there isn't any on the building. The decorative work in question includes the brick around the front door to the apartments, which are laid on their sides, if I understand correctly, which makes the rows wider and is referred to as a soldier forming and the darker bricks at the top of the windows which were also used to make the rectangle on the front of the building. Those bricks are turned so that their short ends are the ones facing out. On a final note, I don't know if the upper floors are still apartments today, but if they are, then I can't imagine the very restful apartments because Shays is a 24-hour bar, which I didn't even know was a thing until I got to Nevada. And it's surprisingly common here. Definitely one of the benefits of living in the Silver State. people who only smoke when you drink, then you probably already know this place. The right half of this building has been a smoke shop for as long as I've lived in Reno. The other half of the building has been a whole bunch of things over the years I've lived here, usually the sort of things that go out of business the following year. Officially, this building is known as the Reno Pet Food Market, which is surprising since it also started as yet another grocery store, although it had a short life as a grocery store, originally being built and opened in 1923 by the same Louis Gunn.
Gunter, who moved a few doors down in 1928, putting him right next door to the fancy new Piggly Wiggly, which obviously made sense to him, or one assumes it did. For some reason, a bunch of businesses cycled through this building until the 40s, when its longest surviving tenants moved in. One being a home appliance store, which finally closed sometime in the 80s, and the other being the Reno Pet Food Market, which closed in 1975, yet gave this building its name. The interesting thing about the Reno Pet Food Market, at least in 2021, is that they offered both a drive through and free delivery, which I assume would be very appreciated by current pet owners, almost as much as the fresh cuts of meat they offered, which I find to be very unusual. I don't know many pet shops that actually offer fresh cuts of meat. And about that, I could be wrong, but I assume that prepared and packaged food is a modern invention, and that you probably had to cook your own pet's food along with your own, which makes having a pet sound like a much bigger chore in the olden days. I mean, I know plenty of lazy dog owners who can't even be bothered to walk their pets farther than the sidewalk in front of their homes. <laughs> lot later than most of its neighbors, having been built in the late 40s. A lot of the buildings that we've been looking at on Virginia Street were either replacing homes that were demolished or add-ons to residences. This building was once the house and property of the Segali family. Segal? Well, it's got an E in it, so I'll say Segal. Segal? Well, however you pronounce it. I feel like I've said this before, but one has to imagine the street as a regular neighborhood full of houses and yards which is obviously difficult now that it's a commercial corridor, but that only came about because of the invention of the car and the need to get from one end of Reno to the other. Mr. and Mrs. Jack Segali settled in Reno in 1917 after Jack had spent over a decade moving among various mining camps chasing the next mineral strike. One assumes that a mining camp is not the sort of place where one starts a family, especially since they tended to disappear almost as fast as they sprang up. So Jack spent several decades running a plumbing and heating business out of their home. Mr. Segali died in 1932 and was survived by his wife Jenny and son Vernon, who continued to live in their large house and lot while more and more of their neighbors knocked down their houses to build commercial buildings. It was definitely a stroke of good luck that they waited until the late 40s to build out their property. Because by that time, people waiting to get a divorce were looking for a quieter street to live on. Office space in downtown was becoming difficult to find, and parking was definitely a must by the 50s, or I guess 40s. On a side note, parking has never been a thing in any of the commercial districts that I've seen that were built before the Second World War. And it always makes me wonder where people are parking before then. Anyway, they even had enough room left over on their property to move the house to the quieter side of the block where Jenny continued to live until her death in the 70s, on top of building their spacious modern office building. These days, this building is mostly known for being the home of Recycled Records, which has been here for as long as I've lived in Reno. It's not exactly the cheapest place I've ever looked for a record, but I've definitely found more than a few good LPs there, and they still sell cassette tapes, which is always appreciated. And that ends the second part of the walking tour of Midtown Reno. The third part will be the conclusion of the short series. From that point, it will be back to exploring ghost towns and whatever else catches my interest while I wander around for work and pleasure. If you found that useful, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, junior archaeologists, don't forget to have a nice day.